squeaks? Are you all ready for our winter walk? I can't wait to go snowshoeing with you. Yeah, it is cold out there, but look how beautiful it is. All the snow and the air and, oh, squeaks, I bet the fort's pond will be completely frozen over. Ooh, ice skating would be fun, but our pond's probably a little too small for that. But we might be able to slide around on it a little if we're careful. Before you ever go out onto something like a frozen lake or pond, even if it looks solid, Check with your grown-ups to make sure it's safe. Sometimes there's only a thin layer of ice on top with really cold liquid water underneath. <laughs> Will it crack? That's a really good question, Squeaks. Well, it depends. <laughs> it's not exactly about being too heavy, although that's part of it. The real reason that the ice might crack is that our bodies would apply too much pressure to it. Sure, I can explain what pressure is, but to do that, I first have to explain what a force is. <laughs> no, not the force from Star Wars squeaks, but forces in the real world are still super awesome. And they are all around us all the time. They're acting on our table and the whole fort and even you and me. If I were to take a step onto the ice, the weight of my body would push down on the surface or top of the ice. And because the ice doesn't move, that surface pushes back up on me with the exact same strength. Those two pushes are examples of a force. Forces are how much two things push or pull on each other when they meet. And pressure tells us how much pushing or pulling is being done in a certain area. For example, if I stepped out onto the ice and just stood there, all of my weight and all of my force is pushing down on an area that's the size of the bottom of my shoes. My feet are pretty small, so that's a lot of force pushing down on a little area, and that creates a lot of pressure. And too much pressure on ice can be a very bad thing. It can make the ice crack. But if I were lying down, the pressure would be a lot lower because my weight, my force, spreads out from just my tiny feet to my belly and my arms and my legs. <laughs> That's right, Squeaks, just like a polar bear. If a polar bear finds themselves on ice that's too thin, they'll slide on their belly. That spreads their weight out so they don't put too much pressure in one spot. And then the bear can cross the ice without breaking it. Don't worry, Squeaks, there's no polar bears near the fort. We're a little too far south for them. But there are smaller animals here that use the same strategies to get around in the winter. Have you ever seen the feet of a lynx or snowshoe hare? They have big, wide paws and can spread their toes out. Their feet let them spread their weight over a larger area, so they create less pressure on the ground when they walk. This means they can walk over the snow without falling in. Oh, that's exactly right, Squeaks. That's how snowshoes work. Do you want to play make-believe lynx and hare on our walk? <laughs> and maybe if the pond looks safe, we can pretend to be polar bears. <laughs> yes, ice can be super slippery. It's another reason to be careful when you're walking or skating on ice, but it can be fun too. Do you know why ice is slippery? <laughs> you're right, friction. Squeaks remembered the fun we had with our water slides when we learned about friction. Friction is also a kind of force, and it's made whenever two things rub up against each other. The rougher the two things rubbing against each other, the more friction there is between them. The smoother they are, the less friction. It's like when you walk barefoot on a smooth floor, your feet are just a little rough and keep you from slipping around. But if you go running with socks on, you slip and slide. <laughs> yes, just like on ice, that's right, Squeaks. But that doesn't completely explain why ice is so slippery. If you rub your hands together quickly, you'll see that friction can cause things to heat up. Try with me. Here. Feel my hands now. They're warm! So, as you move along the ice, scientists think that you create just enough warmth to melt the top layer of the ice. Ice is liquid water that has been frozen solid. When it melts, it turns back into liquid water. 
And liquid water is very slippery. It creates less friction than solid ice does. That makes it easier to glide around, whether you're wearing shoes or skates or lynx paws. What? Do you want to hear something even cooler about ice? Hey, when you have the chance to make a good ice pun, snow way I'm gonna miss that. <laughs> Some scientists also think that the top layer of ice isn't even fully solid or fully liquid. It might be something in between. Now, that layer of kinda solid, kinda liquid water water is so thin, you need a super powerful microscope to see it. But it's enough to make ice just a little bit slippery from the get-go before friction can come along and do any melting that makes ice even more slippery. <laughs> oh, well, Squeaks, you can avoid falling over by keeping track of your belly button. And whatever the rest of your body is doing, keep your belly button directly above where your feet are. That always helps me keep my balance. Just like so. <laughs> oh, oops. I guess robot rats don't really have belly buttons, but if you did have one, it would be right there. <laughs> we might have to do a little experimenting before we go on the ice to figure out the best way for you to find your balance. Let's practice a little more and then head out. <laughs> it sure feels good to be in from the cold. Did you have fun ice skating, Squeaks? Oh, I know you don't want to be done having fun outside, but it is really important to warm back up. What if we warm up in the fort while eating a special treat that will make you feel like you're cold? Ooh, we can eat peppermints! When you feel a peppermint candy in your hand, it doesn't feel cold. But when you taste it, it... It feels cold! Peppermint flavor comes from the peppermint plant, which is in the mint family. Mint plants grow in many places all over the world, and peppermint plants specifically are grown in Asia, Europe, and North America. Mint plants are known for being hardy, which means they can survive harsher environments than other plants. They can live in places where it gets really cold or really hot, and if they need to, they can survive without access to a lot of water. Mint is also known for growing fast and smelling, well, minty. The leaves and stems of mint plants have little bits of oil all over them that many people think taste really good. That's why we use the leaves, flowers, and oil from the peppermint plant in all sorts of things to flavor food, tea, and even toothpaste, and of course, peppermint candy. Oh, good question, Squeaks. Peppermint makes your mouth feel cold because it contains a chemical called menthol. And it's kind of a microscopic magician because it tricks your tongue. What do you remember about how our tongues taste things, Squeaks? Ooh, yes, our tongues have taste buds. Inside each taste bud are tiny little sensors called taste receptors. When you lick or eat something, these little receptors catch the flavor and tell your brain what it tastes like. There are five kinds of receptors that can each catch a different flavor. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami a savory flavor found in foods like meat and cheese. Our sense of taste isn't just important for enjoying different foods, it can also help keep us safe. Many poisonous things, as well as food that's no longer safe to eat, tastes bad. They might be really bitter or just plain gross. And your tongue can pick up on those really bad tastes, letting you know you need to spit out whatever icky, unsafe thing you were eating. It is cool that our tongues can keep us safe. But our tongues have other ways to sense danger. Squeaks, do you remember some of the other senses we have? That's right! Besides tasting, our senses let us do things like see, hear, smell, and feel. Our tongue is famous for tasting, but did you know 
it can feel too? Your tongue is also covered in sensors that can feel mm -hmm. pressure and pain, and even temperature. And they send that information to our brains. It's important for your brain to know if you're trying to eat or drink something that's too hot or too cold and could hurt you. So in addition to our taste receptors that tell the brain, yum, this thing is sweet, or yuck, this thing is super bitter, our tongues have receptors that can tell the brain, ow, this thing is too hot or cold. But sometimes they can get a little confused by certain foods. Exactly! Like when you eat something spicy, your tongue's temperature receptors think that that food is hot, even if it isn't. Yeah! So menthol is kind of the opposite of spicy. When your tongue touches something with menthol in it, the temperature receptors are activated, just like they would be if you put an ice cube in your mouth. So even though our peppermint candies are warm from sitting in this bowl all day, our brains got the message that we ate something cold. <laughs> That's right, Squeaks. It is really cool. Some other types of mint plants have menthol in them too. So you can also experience this brain tricking flavor by eating things with spearmint in them, like mint chocolate chip ice cream, which really is cold and is sometimes made with spearmint instead of peppermint. But I think peppermint is my favorite mint flavor. It always makes me think of winter time. Oh, that's a good question, Squeaks. Peppermint makes us feel cold. So why do we eat it when it's already cold outside here at the fort? Well, hundreds of years ago, hard candies were popular in Europe as a wintertime treat because that was the only time of year when the cold temperatures outside could stop the candies from melting. And peppermint was a popular flavor to put into those candies because unlike other flavors that would get weaker while the candy was cooking, peppermint flavor stayed yummy and strong. Because the peppermint candies could only be made when it was cold out, many people in Europe started to connect peppermint flavor with the cold winter months and their special winter holidays. And today, lots of people still prefer to eat peppermint flavored treats during the European winter months, especially December and January. <laughs> Yeah, it's a tradition, but we can enjoy peppermint candies any time of the year now. I wonder, our candies taste cold today when it's super cold outside. Do you think they'll taste different in summer when it's hot outside? <laughs> okay, we'll make a note to eat some peppermints again in the summer. I can't wait to test this experiment. Hey there, everyone. Squeaks and I were enjoying some peppermint treats. They taste so cool and wintry, but now we want to try another kind of winter dessert, and Squeaks thought of gingerbread. And I thought, why don't we have a tasty treat and do a little science by building a gingerbread house? <laughs> oh, that's a great idea, Squeaks. Let's make the fort out of gingerbread. We should have a plan before we get started. That's what engineers do when they design buildings. Part of that plan includes picking the materials we should use and what properties those materials should have. Properties are characteristics or qualities that make a material special. They're the things you can notice about a material just by using your senses, like what color it is or how hard or soft it feels or how sweet it tastes. For example, take the top of this table. How would you describe it, Squeaks? Oh, yeah. The surface feels smooth and hard, and it certainly looks blue. Those are all examples of properties. Our fort's walls and roof are going to be made of gingerbread cookies. So what properties should our cookies have? Ooh, I agree. It's important that the cookies taste good. But that property isn't going to help our gingerbread fort be strong and sturdy. Let's think of another property that might help. There are lots of recipes for gingerbread. Some make soft, chewy gingerbread, and some make gingerbread that's more crunchy. Ooh, exactly, Squeaks! The cookies we use can't be too soft, or the walls will crumble and the fort won't stand up. 
We'll need cookies that are a little bit harder. Walls in any building, gingerbread or not, have to be strong and hard enough to hold up a roof. But they also can't be too firm because then they'll shatter under all the weight they're trying to support. So our gingerbread has to be pretty hard, but also a little bendy, so it can both stand tall and hold up our fort's roof without breaking. We'll also want to make sure that we bake the cookies so they're completely done. Do you remember when we talked about heat changing the properties of eggs? How it can make them go from goopy to hard? Well, the heat from our oven will change the properties of cookie dough too. It changes soft dough into crisp cookies, which we'll need for our gingerbread walls and roof, as well as any other pieces to get that perfect fort shape. So what do you say, Squeaks? Let's put on our engineer hats and draw a picture of the pieces we need. Okay, we have a drawing or model of what our gingerbread fort might look like when we're done building. We have the right cookies baked, cooled, and cut into the right shapes. Now, how do we get the cookies to stand up straight and not topple over? We need to get the edges of the walls to stick together. So what's a material that has the properties of feeling sticky and tasting good? That's a great idea, Squeaks. But like we did with our gingerbread, we have to choose an icing that has the right properties. Icing that's too thin won't be strong enough to hold the pieces together. And if it's too runny, it won't dry quickly and the pieces of our fort will fall over. Ooh, you're right. This is kind of tricky, but engineers don't give up. Let's give our icing a try and see what happens. <sighs> It took a little work, but we've gotten the walls up and the roof is in place. We used icing as glue to stick the walls and the roof of the fort together. <laughs> yep, it's time to decorate our gingerbread fort. We need to be careful that we don't put too much stress on the walls and the roof by adding a lot of heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, stress. But stress in buildings isn't quite the same as the stress our bodies feel if we're anxious or sad about something. Stress is made of the forces that are pushing and pulling on the materials in our fort. If the roof is very heavy with decorations, it puts a lot of stress on the walls. If there's too much stress, the icing we use to hold the fort together won't be strong enough and the walls will fall apart. A lot of stress might even cause the cookies to break. So I think we should add only a few decorations at a time, stick them on with icing, and then wait for the icing to dry. Do you agree? <laughs> nice. And while we're waiting, we can snack on a little bit of leftover gingerbread. <laughs> Thanks for joining Squeaks and me here at the fort. If you want to keep learning and having fun with us and all of our other friends, be sure to hit the subscribe button and we'll see you next time on SciShow Kids.